different way. Okay, so like I said, I'll be talking about hazard analysis and critical control point planning. From now on, we'll call it hazard. Really quickly first, I wanted to describe, find some terminology about invasive species. One of them is non-indigenous. And when I say non-indigenous, I'm talking about species that are not native to an area. And the other term I wanted to define is invasive. And so when we're talking about invasive species, we're talking about non-native species or non-indigenous species that have some sort of impact uh, to economy, ecology, coal or human health. Terms that are important for HACCP are target and non-target. Here's a cute cartoon I use all the time to describe this. And I apologize if there's some confusion. Uh, I know that in the invasive species world, sometimes when we mention targets, we're talking about something that we're trying to get rid of. And if you think about it, it's the same process. So what we're targeting in this case, for, for this particular cartoon on how poodles came to America, is they're trying to ship bananas. So the bananas are the target, and the target are Home with invasive species, Santin, the former director of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, is quoted saying that they're probably the single greatest threat in our country to native wildlife. Sometimes you'll see habitat degradation list above invasive species, but usually they're one, two, or, or, or two, one. Economic impacts from this species. Right, this is a <laughs> emptying its ballast water, and there's tins that have come to the shipping industry about, about, about ballast water because of invasive species. So there's an economic impact right there. The pipe that you see right here, can you guys see that right there? Okay. Those are again zebra mussels that are in pipe, and there's increased cost of doing business for some some folks like Mexican Water District in Southern California. There was a recent news article that came out that mentioned that they're spending fifteen million dollars a year just dealing with quagga and zebra mussels. So definitely you see the economic impacts there. I guess that's good. Okay, so ecological impacts. An example of kudu and right here. Invasive species, they outcompete and crowd out other species and can cause changes to food webs as well. And then health, uh, this is a picture of a lionfish right here, but a more common example that's popping up in my local neighborhood of a non-native species that's affecting human health would be West Nile virus. And then cultural impacts, reduced recreational opportunities is a really good cultural impact from invasive species. So again, pathways and vectors, how are species moved around? So we talked about the impacts, now we're gonna talk about how they're moved around from one place to another. Get here, well we mentioned the shipping industry. And to this introductions of invasive species, we can't really pinpoint the exact time and date and vector, but we get a pretty good idea. So we, the shipping industry, has a potential for moving invasive species in ballast water and in some of the cargo. 
Uh, there's cave and cultured organisms. This would be for water and land based. You could have aquaculture facilities for rearing fish, for aquatic fish, more aquatic fish there, and then aqua skiing, like with this water hyacinth here. There's also terrestrial examples as well. And then creation. So, the example I was thinking about today was if somebody going fishing, going on a fishing expedition in New Zealand and they were coming from California, well, they may not want to be transporting invasive species on maybe their waders. So, that's another way that invasive species are moved around. And then there's intentional stocking, whether it's for recreation, environmental reasons, in the form of bio logical controls for food. The example here is uh, crayfish, and the story that I like to tell is about crayfish that were taken from Lake Tahoe and moved to Sweden. And I think they took about 25,000 individuals and moved them there. And it, that I've been told is that that. The native fish populations in Sweden have been affected, um, not particularly by this introduction, but by an introduction from crayfish from Turkey. Once invasive species get here, what we're going to focus on is what we can do to prevent their spread once they get here. And some of the pathways that we'll talk about and some of the vectors would be natural resource management activities, with fire management, with restoration, construction, utilities, and the like, outdoor recreation, use of recreational watercraft and trailers. Essentially, I like to think of it as outdoor activities, things that are being done outside, and activities that are we're moving great distances. So, with the pathways, we require multiple solutions. The thing that's been done is there's been invasive species legislation. I'm not going to go into detail about all of these pieces of legislation because I want to get into talking more about HACCP itself. There, are, there is information about this at invasivespecies.gov, and I think it's actually invasivespeciesinfo.gov or in the manual referenced earlier in the manual. So invasive species is in species legislation is one thing that's being done to combat invasive species. But I also like to reference what I call the invasive species toolbox, which involves prevention, keeping them out of an area, early detection and rapid response, control and then management or so our business and our program gives information about all of these different aspects of the invasive species toolbox. However, today we're going to be focusing on the prevention aspect. Okay, and if prevention is worth a pound of cure. So it's really important to think about that. If there is something small that you can be doing to prevent the movement of invasive species, it does worth a pound of cure. So what do we do? Well, we like to talk about best management practices. And with best management practices, we could be talking about freezing your waders or washing your waders or those type of things. So we like to call those best management practices. And talk about HACCP, and we consider HACCP a best management practice. And, and some of you thinking, well, we already have decontamination procedures, or we already have, have procedures, you know, best management pra practices. So, add some layers to those basic decontamination procedures or best management practices. And HACCP really is a process, and in the process, 
about your activity as a whole, and it's a step-by-step -step method to consider all of the pathways in the that you're focused on. And it's controls for actions at the best opportunity to remove those non-targets or invasive species. Methods put in place to ensure that the prevention is successful and backup plans or contingency plans if those controls don't work. There's a documentation process. Components of HACCP, the key components of HACCP are to think about your activities that you're conducting, break them down into separate tasks, and then analyze those tasks for potential to move and base the species around. And then once you determine that there's a risk, then you implement, implement controls. And half of the process you go to, and, and the final product isn't necessarily the most important thing. Going through the process and thinking about your activity in a step-step -step fashion and thinking about where to implement the controls and to think of how the controls operate and to think of what you're going to do if the controls aren't operating properly, that thought process, just going through that process, is going to help to reduce the risk of moving invasive species around. Planning really is essential. Like new plans, a large part of the value of developing a house of plan is a process itself. While explaining your planned actions in detail, you will reveal new questions and insights that can identify unrecognized prevention opportunities. In the short run, this may not work easier, but in the long run, it can eliminate serious problems that could come from unintended invasions and any benefits from the original work. Therefore, through proper asset planning, natural resources will be better protected. Okay, so why are we even talking about HACCP? Well, HACCP gets its origins from the food industry and the space program. And they didn't want containers going up into space with the astronauts, so they came up with this process so they wouldn't send those contaminants up into space because they didn't want the astronauts getting sick in that type of environment. That could be really scary. Well, the fishery got a hold of it and said, well, this is a really good idea. And they're implementing it. And Sea Grant, and thanks much to Sea Grant in Minnesota, they developed HACCP, Sea uh, Grant, Michigan, Sea Grant, Minnesota, developed HACCP for their wild bait fish industry. And they did that so that they weren't unintentionally invasive species around in the process of harvesting wild bait fish. And after a few years, the Fish and Wildlife Service developed a HACCP program, and that's why I'm speaking to you here today. Five-step planning process. The step is to describe your activity, and this could be the activity that you're doing. It would be in the outdoor environment. Step two, to take your activity and break it down into se sequential steps. Step would be to identify the basic species or the potential non-targets. Four puts the steps or the tasks together with the non-targets and analyzes each task for risk of spreading the invasive species. And it all implements the controls at this point and determines the critical control control point. Step five puts down information about the control point, the critical control points, and the controls that are part of that critical control point, and gives detailed information about, about those control points. And we refer to those as, as limits and criteria. I'll go over those in, a, in more detail later. 
5 also puts down information about supporting documentation and provides information about a backup plan. So now in the right direction. So it's really important to have a management commitment. To have staff from the folks out in the field doing work all the way up through to pro pro managers, excuse me, or even directors. There are passive training opportunities, but I mentioned earlier, again, we do a one and a half day workshop. Some of you might have been, some of you have been in, in trainings where we've done a half day workshop or a one day workshop, and we really felt that, that those workshops weren't as successful as they could have been, and it just takes that much time uh, to go through the process and have it really sink in. So we're doing a day and a half training now. And it's also important for HACCP team in assembly. It's really important. So anybody can sit down and look at, at the tasks and assign some kind of risk and then put them in a control or write down a control, but it really requires um, different pieces of an or organization for a HACCP plan to be implemented correctly. Okay, really quickly, I'm just going to go through some studies for reasons why or how HACCP could have helped. The uh, example that we use commonly is about ink stam natural fish hatchery. And essentially the, the, the story here is that largemouth bass were stocked from one area and moved to another area, and there were gizzard shad in those largemouth bass. So if they would have had a HACCP place and in place with the proper controls, they may have been able to prevent this unwanted introduction. So interest of time, I'm just going to go through these slides a little quickly. And here's once the the gear were introduced, this was the portion of their invasion. Information about these two case studies in the middle as well. A new study that we talked about is from Ridgefield National Wildlife Refuge. And what they did is they planted some some seeds from the Sacramento Valley and they unintentionally brought some plants, some unwanted plants with them. So there's two examples of where the date and how important planning is in HACCP. I want to talk for the next, oh, 15 minutes or so about the steps themselves. And this is usually, uh, the presentation that I just gave takes about 20, 25 minutes to give, and then this next step is, these next presenta presentations going over the steps takes approximately four hours, but I'm going to do it in 15 minutes. So. Activity description, step one here. What we're looking at is we want, this is the important part down here in the activity description. Well, out here is the and where, how, and why of the activity that you're looking at for the potential of moving invasive species. Examples of activities. I'm not going through this list, but I'll just give you a second to look through them. And your activity on this list, it doesn't mean that you can't create a HACCP plan for it. Okay, so with those activities, there's a potential for invasive species to move on some of the gear that's being moved. A target in this case would be like down here it, with her waders and her net, her kick net, even amphibian surveys, some of the gear that they're using. So you can see that there's a range of, of invasive species that potentially could be moved. Wait a second, that's a club up here. What we want to look at is the quad. So in case people were curious, the, the quad 
and the zero muscle gets from the the like the horse in Africa, and then there's an extinct relative called the quagga. All right, well, really quickly, I'm just going to go through an example. I'm only going to go through the example for steps one, two, and three. Four and five, you can fi find information about them, again, in the manual. Contact me and we'll put together a training. So I put together a fun little example, a hypothetical. There's a tub here, hypothetical HACCP plan. Man management objective that I made up was a habitat survey for the recovery of cutthroat trout. Call person, well, I'm, I'm project manager, so it's me. Um, 800 love fish. There's my email in case you have it. Who's going to be doing this? The Cutthroat National Fish Hatchery personnel. What they're doing, they're going to measure uh, riparian vegetation density, the Thompson Basin, around once a month. They're going to gather gear, travel to the site. Conduct the sampling and then return to the warehouse and then water data on riparian habitat of the long or the cutthroat trap. So the things that I describe to people when they do send me plans for me to go over is, is you want to give people enough detail in an activity description to put them in in the Activity to give them a frame of reference for the activity, so you don't have to give a whole, you know, 20 pages about the why for why you're doing the work. You just, you just need to make it so that somebody reading this can be familiar with the activity, understand where it's taking place, when it's taking place, are you moving from one watershed to another, and, and so to do this because then it can help you in break on your tasks, which is in step two. Step two, like I said, break activity into tasks. It an outline of the what should happen of this moment what should happen don't get into the, the details about, well, what if this, what if that. Think about your standard operating procedures or policies, however you're conducting your work, and think about how on a routine act, on a routine day, how things progress. You want to list the most basic steps. We don't need to know that you stop at Starbucks uh, to get coffee. Um, we don't need to know that you put your waiters on and then your waiter boots. So just, you know, you don your gear, you put on your gear. You can do sampling, those those type of things. Each task is given a number, simple title, and a brief description. A really powerful tool for conducting HACCP plans or going through the process of conducting HACCP plans, and there's no, there's no place on the forms to do this, but it's to create a diagram, create a map of what you're doing, how, what, give a graphical reference for where the activity takes place. And this can really be powerful in the next step in conducting the risk analysis. So it's an aid to risk analysis. And I created this map quickly. Uh, somebody went back and edited it because it wasn't quite is as good as I wanted, but but lines and circles, that's all you need. It's going to be very basic. Okay, here's the example from the Cutthroat Trout Hypothesis Plan that I talked about. So it's one, drive to warehouse and load appropriate gear for sampling activity, and then drive to the sampling site. Or simply load gear and drive to the site. And versions of HACCP didn't have the title and the description, and some of the formatting became a little bit cumbersome. 
So that's why we decided to add in the title. So the was to unload gear from the vehicle, prepare gear to conduct sampling, and then conduct the survey. So simply unload gear and conduct survey. After returning the vehicle, the crew will pack up the gear, some foot, reload the gear, four, return to warehouse and unload gear. So we've created step one and two. So we know the activity, we've broken it into tasks. Now we have to add the other element, which is identifying potential non targets. So remember, when we're talking about targets, Bananas, in this example, bananas are the target and poodles are the non-target. Targets can be vertebrates, invertebrates, plants, other organisms, essentially anything that you don't want to move from one place to another. So you get a hassle plan that doesn't involve invasive species if you didn't want to move, move something from one place to another. But for this example, we're solely going to focus on invasive species. Oh, developing potential non-targets. So the key here is potential. And when you're creating these lists, you want to you want to consult with regional and local ex experts. Now, some folks have called our program and said said Jonathan, you know, we want to know what invasive species are in your area, and it might be somebody that's conducting macro invertebrate surveys. And I said, well, you guys. Are conducting surveys out there so we're not really sure about what species are there which is fine so you may want to include some species that are high profile um, if you're not exactly sure what species are in an area and then jumping from site to site you probably need to have some sort of control and put in place and this goes to the other act of developing the potential non-target list don't get up in whether or not something should be included, whether or not it's going to be moved from one place to another. Step for the non-target analysis worksheet will do that for you. It'll tell you, it'll allow you to write down whether or not there's opportunities to pick up the species and then move it. If you're on the fence about whether or not to include a species, put it in there. If someone mentions it, put it down. When team members feels it feels like there's a potential risk for being an invasive species put in there. All right, here's the list that they came up with. Simply they're putting amphibians down and the bullfrog in particular. Snail. They're concerned about moving Eurasian milfoil and purple loosestrife. And also concerned about moving chytrid fungus and whirling disease. This is just an example. And if I saw this plan, I'd, I'd may comment back and say, you know, are there other species that you're concerned about? Maybe you might want to add in, in there, you might want to add in quagga and zebra mussels. Just an example. Okay. So the next step. The planning process is the non-target analysis worksheet. What target analysis worksheet does? It looks at your task, looks at your potential non-targets, and then it analyzes the risk and asks the simple question. Are any non target significant? And it's for a simple answer either yes or no. The important part here providing a justification to what your answer was to that question. So you said yes here, vertebrates are significant. Why are they significant? Is it because you're in contact with water or that there's a chance that you might? Might be in contact with bullfrog or water at that point in time, or you could say no and say that 
that they're not coming into contact. But either a yes or no answer here, you have to have some sort of justification. And any time you put in a yes answer in this column, you have to look at you apply some sort of control. And the question here says, what control measures can be applied during this task to stop the spread of non-targets? So we've in entered a control here. Then you go into the next process with, with is the best point, is this task a critical control point? Is this the best point to remove your potential on targets from your activity? Okay, so really quickly, I want to talk about, I want about controls. Let me go through and erase all of my... Talk about controls in the end of time. Okay, some examples of control measures. And after I'm done with this slide, there's a slide that goes over or, or there's a link to a really nice video created by Eric and the Clean Water Team, State Water Resource Control Board. They go over several of these these control measures. So things that you want, want to use, you may want to use chemical, and I like to think of chemical as being used as a last resort. Only use chemicals if you absolutely have to. So you essentially apply a chemical, identify a chemical, chemical, do some more removal with a brush, and then maybe rinse it off. And this is just one example of how you can apply a chemical. You could use a bath. Um, you could spray it down. There's other ways of doing it. Eric's video is a little better than, in, or a lot better at describing this than than the example here. But you can use chemicals. There's all drying, and with you have to consider the environment you're working in. If you're working near the Golden Gate Bridge and it's during the summer and it's foggy and it's 65 degrees, which would be wonderful since I'm in the California Valley right now, the Central Valley, and it's really hot here. And I'm sure it's 65 in San Francisco right now. But you have to consider your environment. For example, quagga and zebra mussels, they can live in this environment a long time out of water. You're, well, maybe you're working in Death Valley, so it might be feasible there. And they're freezing. So, well, you may not want to use this freezer, but putting your into a freezer. There's all manual removal. Not like this guy, but, but, but there are, you can manually remove things, and there is a section in the HACCP manual that goes over how to conduct manual removers, removals. Water, either with water pressure, like this, this, this Cadillac unit here, this decontamination unit, cost 250000 dollars so it may not be appropriate for everybody, but it does apply water pressure, and it does apply heat. Eric mentions that uh, his video about uh, thermal treatment. You can also get dedicated equipment. This is one of my favorite ones because it's simple to just get two sets of waters if you're going to to do two different water or if you're you're sampling one water body one day you can freeze one set of waders and then pick those up in the morning when you go out and do a different water body the next day. Okay, the equipment. And you manage your field operations. And this one takes a little bit more thinking, but for example, our, our juvenile fish 
monitoring program, so the direction in which they sample. This is the SAC server right here. And the sample moved from dam to upstream. Change that. And from upstream to downstream. So not to not uh, they're reducing that risk of moving invasive species in their activity. Okay, the link to the video that Eric created. I think it's a really good video and it goes over several of those techniques. Okay, on to step five, and like I mentioned, I'm not going to go over the de details of steps four and five. Um, I'm not going to go into them in depth because we're actually almost out of time. But step five is the important part of step five. Um, well, all of it's important, but the really important part is this part right here. These two, and this this is what really sets us ab above just a basic management practice is it in information prescribed ranges limits or or can or criteria for your control measure so again prescribed ranges limits or criteria for instance if you're going to freeze something how long are you going to freeze it for and what temperature does it have to be maintained at and then it provides for monitoring, monitoring that the prescribed ranges and limits, limits and criteria are being met. So we're not monitoring the control measure. You necessarily put in here how the control measure is going to happen. You're putting here that the that these prescribed ranges, limits, or criteria are being met. And then all another important point is looking at the action. So what this is your backup plan. What happens if things don't go as planned? So what happens if the power turns off and your freezer didn't freeze and it wasn't frozen? What are you going to do in that scenario? Step five all has a spot for putting in supplementation. And then finally implementing HACCP. Well, HACCP, we like to consider it a living document. If it sits on your desk and get looked at or updated, um, it may not be such a great thing. Uh, it can be a good tool to introduce new staff about activities that are being done about your standard operating procedures and about how to um, help prevent spread of invasive species. And sometimes sites change and, and operating procedures change. That's what we mean by a living document, and we recommend that at least annually you go back and look at your asset plan. Documentation. This type of information by, might be MSDS for a chemical that you're using. Also include your standard operating procedures, um, procedures for how to do decontamination, maybe manual for that freezer that's hopefully working. And I mentioned that uh, the HACCP website does have some plans to look at, but there are, I do uh, share plans with, with people um, some just take things out and phone number, contact information, and if there's any proprietary information that, that people don't share, but but, it, but it has a plan that goes over how to conduct a, or conducting a plan for like a restoration activity. I have some examples, and I'd be happy to, to uh, share those with folks. Has a plans can be but also, again, like I mentioned with the website, take not all HACCP plans are created equal. 
I mentioned the website and the resources. And stewardship, you know, we're all out there. We're, we're, we're monitoring things and conducting surveys for a reason, and that's to, a lot of times is to help protect or study an environment, and it's really important that we're not, you know, contributing to a decline of species. We're doing that by spreading invasive species around. With that, I think we're all done, and I'd hear some questions.